Right, so welcome to episode one of the Crucible Bootcamp with your host, myself, King Koala. Um, some background about myself. Uh, I've been playing Destiny for about a year now. Uh, it's been, as far as PvP goes, uh, it's been kind of crazy because I've never really gotten into first-person shooters very much. My background is very much like I played League of Legends for a long time. I still play Magic the Gathering. Um, and I did a lot of sports growing up. I wrestled, I played football, I was in cross country. I still run a lot. And my family's huge soccer fans, so I play a lot of soccer too uh, when I'm with my family. So basically, the premise of the boot camp is for everyone else to get better. Um, if you care about my stats, you can go look them up. They're publicly known on Destiny Tracker or Guardian GG, whatever your flavor is. Uh, my my gamer tag is King Koala. I play on PS4. So uh, personally, I don't think my stats should have much bearing on the information I'm presenting because if it's wrong, you're going to think it's wrong no matter what my stats are. And if it's right, you're going to think it's right no matter what my stats are. It's just going to have a little more weight for some people. I know that. So again, if you care, it's King Koala. You can go look at it. Yeah, Fallout. I play on PS4. You can leave. Bye. Mr. I just got donated money for a PS4. <laughs> uh, so this is for you. I'm not doing this for myself. Uh, I review my gameplay all the time, and I tell everyone that the best way to improve your game is to record your matches and then watch them. Take notes, watch them twice. I, I personally try to watch them twice, once just watching the whole way through, and then the second time around, I pick apart the plays or the specific fundamental mistakes that I'm making in the game. And so that's sort of uh, the philosophy I'm going to use going into this. We're not going to watch the gameplay twice. Um, I'm just going to... I've already watched it. We're just going to go through and watch it together. It's about... Uh, this particular clip is from Mythic Owl Bear, and it's a salvage match. Um, and we're going to go through, it's about 12 minutes long, we're going to go through and watch what he does right, what he does wrong, and kind of what that means as far as the fundamental mistakes he's making and the fundamental things that he's getting right as well. And it's on Anomaly, which is why I have Anomaly up. So I might be tabbing back and forth um, depending on if I want to show you something specifically as, a, as, a, as he makes the plays that he does or the makes the plays that he doesn't and show you what he could have done better or right or what he did right and how he could have done it completely wrong. So let's get started. So he's been AFK for a little while, but, and the, the, the audio is going to be muted. Um, this one he sent me, it had some, uh, some commentary on it. So right there, I'll pause it right there. He, he starts off. And one of the biggest things about using the last word when you're getting rushed is you need to backpedal. So we'll rewind it a little bit, Let's start over. So he, he backpedals and he's fine. He's still backpedaling. He doesn't just stop and stay in one place while he's firing. He's constantly moving backwards and that's creating a gap of space for shotgunners. If you use the last word, this is like the first thing you need to learn is that you use the last word to stop shotgunners. You don't, it, it, you don't use it because, hey, it's good to pair for a sniper. You use it because it'll stop a specific type of gameplay that's counter to your own. When you snipe, obviously the worst thing for you to happen to you is to get gap closed. So when that happens, you need to be able to defend yourself. And the last word is probably, uh, in my opinion, the best option for that. So he's engaging here and he wastes his grenade. And this is something I notice in a lot of people that uh, have submitted gameplays. A lot of grenades are wasted mid-fight. Um, you don't really want to waste your grenades mid-fight. You either need to use them to prime or to finish off, not like in the middle like that uh in that particular instance if i were in his, his position he got a free kill by doing that back pedal you should be constantly checking your radar and at that point he doesn't have a great angle on the guy that's approaching him uh, so uh, an option for him and an option that a lot of people don't necessarily take into account oftentimes is to actually run away um, there's a lot of cover and anomaly that you can dip in and out of um either sliding or jumping or just running away and so you want to reposition take that free kill yeah maybe they'll get a res and they'll but they'll still be behind 50 points and you'll be able to reposition and possibly even snipe the res in his case because he is running a high impact sniper 
So here, he sees a couple a couple people on radar. He knows someone might be in room two, but you don't want to push into it as a sniper. You want to try. What he did was he stood there, stood standing up, uh, on radar. So what that shows on the other person's point of view is they can kind of tell, hey, this guy's in cave. And that's and you can basically try to use that knowledge, giving them free knowledge to pull them out into you. So he sees that his teammate got the guy in room two. He's kind of moving up in room two. There's someone behind him on his radar and someone in front of him. Now, when you're in this kind of position, when you're in room room one, and there's someone out here through this cubby, and there's someone behind you, uh, and you're, let's say his teammate is down on B, he's got to make a decision. You need to make a decision to either push one or push the other or go hide. So he kind of pushes back. He's pulling out. He sees him run. And he wastes his grenade again, which is fine. That would have been a priming grenade. I say waste, but that one would be good if the guy pulled back. Now, he had knowledge that he ran around. So let me switch back. So he's out here. He's right here. And he just saw someone go this way. So when this happens, he kind of you kind of have two decisions to make. You can try to follow this guy. And he knows one of his teammates is over here. His teammate is in cave. So he can try to follow him and cut him off, or what he did instead is try to go here, back through A, a stage. Now this, the problem with this is that if his teammate loses his one, this guy's going to keep going. And he could be anywhere. He could be here, he could just keep looping around. So when you see this like, when you see like this, I know he's playing solo, uh, but if you're in a team you need to call that out and then you need to go support your teammate. Um, you, it's like yes you should expect your teammates to win their 1v1s but there's nothing better uh, than just getting a free kill there's nothing better in the game than just getting a free kill uh, in the worst case scenario your teammate is going to eat the dust he's just going to die and you're going to be able to clean up a kill because he's probably primed already so that's going to be a common theme throughout this particular gameplay is that he Mythic Owlbear doesn't do a great job of supporting his teammates. And I'll cover uh, what it means to be a flanker at the end. But if you don't support your teammates, if that's not your game style, then there's a specific way you have to play the game in order to get the most out of never being a, a great teammate, essentially. And it's okay to, that you know you're not always going to play well on a team, but that doesn't mean like with someone on your back, but that doesn't mean you can't be a good teammate by fulfilling a role. So right here, he pushed in, he primed him with the grenade, but again, like I said earlier, if there's people in front and behind you, you gotta pick one or you gotta run away. And he kinda sat there, and after being primed by that firebolt, he was just dead meat just sitting there. It's better to try to make a play, go in, waste a sniper shot with a quick scope, like do something, but don't wait for them to come and kill you. That's, that's always gonna be a worse option. You should always try to go down fighting. So he kind of, he, he loses his one, no big deal, picks himself back up. This is salvage and they don't really capture the point very much often during this game. So he dodges, he baits out a firebolt, he gets, he misses it and he sees him coming over here, he takes a couple shots, pulls back. Okay, right here. When he jumps in like this and you're reloading, he still had three shots. He still has three shots in his mag and he knows that he hit him twice. He only needs two shots to go down. Uh, this is something that I made a mistake a lot when I started playing this game. It's that, you know, I'd run out of bullets in my last word. I'd reload, but I'd continue to engage. You only want to reload when you're behind cover. You never want to reload in the middle of a firefight unless both your weapons are done. Like, if you're getting pinched and you have to kill a guy to get out, and oftentimes that's your only escape is just kill a guy and keep moving... You have to you have to take risky shots with your secondary, uh, and a lot of those shots are incredibly risky with a sniper, especially in this mid range, because you're not going to have a lot of time to scope in and line up a shot. So he f luckily he finishes them off, and the guy just misses way too many shots. Um, so right there, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's the kind of shot that you want to try to make in under pressure. Like he's going to go down here, but if he didn't make that shot. Or if he didn't take that shot, then he would have went down anyway. 
And there's a slight possibility if you if you pre-aim well enough that he's going to scope in and get that kill because that guy was weak and all he needed was a body shot. So as a sniper, that's those are the kind of shots you have to be comfortable making. Like, you have to be willing to miss a lot. And you're going to miss a lot. But if you're never taking those shots, then you're never giving yourself an opportunity to improve. Because you're going you're gonna to remember those times. You get those quick scopes. You know, they're going to get put in your montage. They're going to get... You know, you're going to tweet them out. You're going to brag to your friends. But at the same time, that's something you got to learn how to do if you're going to play at a higher level. That's just... You got to use your weapon and be able to use your weapon in all situations. So again, as I said before, he's not really supporting his teammates. He's kind of doing his own thing. He saw a guy come up here, and you're not hearing the sound, but he went supered. So when you hear a super and you hop down here like this and you don't have an angle, don't challenge. What does he do? He challenges. And he gets punished for it, as he should. You should be punished for taking shots like that. That's incredibly risky. And if he didn't get punished for that, I'd be very surprised. Um, most people are pretty good with using their supers. That's how most people like that don't know how to shoot their gun do get end up getting their kills with their super. Okay. So here he takes a double peek. And I know a lot of people say, don't double peek. But there are... There are specific situations that you can take where it's okay to double peek, or there are specific ways that you can double peek. So he takes the first shot. All right, he misses. They're both in cover. So what this means is that because they're both in cover, this is the time you don't want to double peek. Why? Because it's a 50-50. You see it, that he's already taken damage, so it only takes a body shot, and he hasn't taken any damage yet, so he actually needs a headshot. So it's slightly less risky for you because you have a greater opportunity to get this kill. But the fact is that unless you change the angle at which they're attacking you, it's a complete 50-50 and you don't, want, you don't want that. So he gets lucky. He gets this shot, but what he did he, right after that is what you should always do after taking sniper shots. And that's moving to cover. He moves back into cover, he pulls back out. Every shot, you should be able, you should be able to make shots where you pull into cover to either run away or to assess your next move. His teammate gets a kill. It's been a wipe. He sees on his radar up here. He's coming out. He makes a great snipe. That's fantastic. And those are the kind of those are the kind of things that you ought to be able to do with your sniper. If you see someone on your radar and you kind of know where head head level is, and that's something you should always be practicing, paying attention to where head level is on every map or most of the popular sight lines, you want to be able to make those shots because that, that's an easy kill. So, Heavy's out, he takes a couple shots, and those were great shots to take. So I want to show you guys those shots again. Not too far. So he gets this kill. And why are those great shots? Because the, the angles in which he's taking those shots give him a great opportunity to get back into cover, or he's already in great cover, so he gets an opportunity to readjust. So here, he threw that grenade, Dropped immediately back. That's a really hard, that snipe right there is really hard to make. But you took that shot, which is good. You should always at least try to take the shot unless you're really low on ammo. And, and what does he do? He immediately goes back into cover. He's behind this rock. Again, constantly be, be going back into cover. He tagged him with that with that uh, grenade. They had picked up heavy. He gets a great snipe here on the sword. He sees the bolt caster. He jumps out of the way. That's just good reaction time. Can't really teach people that, but. You can teach people, go back into cover. Always, always go back into cover. So, see some people on radar. Pops a blade. Blade, you... Typically, you want to pop blade close to people. Normally, when you're above them, so you don't really give them a chance to retaliate. Gets a couple good kills. He doesn't get... The salvage points, which are worth more than his super kills, but he still pushes them off the salvage point, which is okay. If I'm going to cap the salvage point, I'm normally going to save my super for uh, normally going to save my super for for defending or actually pushing it, or just shutting down another super. Not necessarily pushing them off the point, but killing them when they get there. It's a lot easier to kill someone when you know exactly where they're coming from, as opposed to moving out into them.
So again, here, he's scoping some lanes that, that he knows where people can come from. Gets a nice clean kill there after his, his buddy kind of eats the dust. So, some little things. Uh, when you use hand cannons, you gotta pace your shots. So right there, him taking a shot, relining up, taking a shot. You wanna you wanna kind of be patient when you're first learning out how to use hand cannons, or when you're using hand cannons in general, until you kind of get the recoil pattern down. You it, it's better for you to land two shots and die than to fire four shots and miss every single one of them. So right there, he's engaging him at an angle where it's really hard for the opponent to see him. He probably only, that would be a head glitch. He probably only could see his head, but you could see the opponent's entire body. When you go for engagements, you want to search for engagements where it's it's a 50-50 location, but based on how you're perceived by the opponent, uh, it's only a 50-50 uh, if you popped out of cover. You want to hide as much of your body as possible. So here he runs, which is exactly what you should be doing. There's two or three guys there. They might be weak, but you don't necessarily need to be a hero. You don't need to force that res. It's only worth 50 points, and if you die, you're down 50 points. At least. Right there, he just misses shots. Some people might call that phantom bull bullets, but I watched that a couple times, and he's just slightly off. And the last word is very unforgiving when it comes to missing bullets. Not only for Bloom, but if you're just a little bit off, it doesn't have a tremendous amount of aim assist. You're going to miss a lot. Okay, he knows that they're on they're on uh, the salvage point. I checked that. He probably should have hit that shot, but that's just kind of unfortunate. So he doesn't really have an angle here. He knows they're on the salvage point, and he knows his, his teammate is over to the left, but he's not supporting his teammate. He goes out here and takes kind of a risky shot and double peeks. You probably shouldn't double take that double peek, because they have perfect information on you. And he's really lucky he jumped there. If he didn't jump there, he would have got 170 by that grenade and immediately died. So he, he gets lucky that he wasn't completely punished for that, but he shouldn't have he shouldn't have been alive there, honestly. So up here on boxes, this is a great location to kind of look down onto heavy and onto the truck. It's good it's a good place to snipe. A lot of these places that are really good to snipe. Uh, they're going to have really weird uh, angles where the head's going to be. So as you get better, at, this is a 50-50. So as you get better at at sniping, you don't need to go to the 50-50s anymore. Or if you do, you know exactly where head level is going to be. So you can make that shot pretty quickly. Like he knew. That's experience. Like when they peek out back, back out like that, he knew where exactly where his head was going to be. As you get better at sniping, you got to learn these weird angles where... It's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult to make the shot. And so then it's just going it, to, a lot of uh, your technique is going to have to come from swiping, either sideways or diagonally, depending on where their head is. But when you first start out, uh, if you want to practice sniping, you should go to the 50-50s always. When you want to practice, when you want to actually snipe, you should either avoid them or approach them in such a way where it isn't as risky to you as a player. And the way you approach those, there's a there's going to be an example later in this, near the end, uh, and how you should approach a sniper lane. It's going to be what a, his opponent does. So you'll see what it looks like from, from a player's point of view, what it looks like when you uh, approach a sniper lane in an unconventional way, or a way that people don't expect. Gets a good, good arc blade kill. <laughs> I believe he took a shot there, again. Gotta take that shot. You're probably gonna die. <laughs> You're pretty out of position of getting chased down by a Soul Titan. You're probably gonna die, so take the shot. You can't really fault anyone for taking shots like that. He know you know they're in cave, so you know. So right there. Right there. We're gonna pass. You know they were in cave, so you know uh you kinda have an idea of how people are gonna move around the map. This is near the very end of the game, so he's seen that people go to this 50-50 quite a bit. Um so I'll rewind that real quick. We'll rewatch that. What it looks like from the opponent. So he comes flying across. Flying across. That's a very, very difficult shot to make. Um, so that's one way you can approach a sniper lane. Is by jumping across the sniper lane. 
That gives you two things. The first thing is it gives you perfect information. You know exactly where that sniper is. You can relay that information to your teammates, or if you have no teammates and you're playing solo, you kind of have an idea of where they're, where they're at. So you can pre-aim if you're going to challenge them. And it, sometimes it's okay to challenge snipers, or you should challenge snipers. You should force them to make the shot. And if they don't, you should kill them because they didn't make the shot. And if they make it, hey, it, that's not any fault of your own. That's all on them. They made a good shot. You might not necessarily have done anything wrong. So again, he knew where, he, as a sniper, you know where they are. But then, as a sniper, it's on you to make the shot. It's no longer on them to challenge you. It's on you to make that shot. So at that point, where someone has either slid or jumped through the lane to get past your, line, your initial shot and forced you to make a follow-up shot or forced you to readjust, it's on you to kind of predict when they're going to move. And if that happens to you, if you're in, in Mythic's position where you're the sniper in this position, that's you because you have no idea when they're going to come out of that corner, uh, you shouldn't even take that shot. You should just leave. You should readjust yourself. You should move out of that lane because you don't know which other opponents are coming. You don't know if there are any grenades coming your way. If heavy's pulled, you don't know if there are rockets coming, but they have information on where you are. And that's one of the worst things to do as a player is to give someone, give the enemy team perfect information where you are and then not to move because that gives them a chance to make a play to to kill you, to finish you off, to push you in a position where it's uh, you're not in an advantage, where it's not going to be even a 50-50 for you. It's going to be a 20-80. You want to maximize the chance that you have not only to survive, but also to succeed. So match is almost over. It's pretty boring. They get... One of his teammates kind of goes big at the end. When it's this close and you're not playing a sweaty, meaning, you know, you can capture the point, just capture the point. You don't need to make any flashy plays. His teammate gets a double, and you saw he was on a five kill spree. So, that's that. All right, so what are some things that Mythic did right in that match? He made a lot of really good predictive plays as he was sniping. Uh, when he was in, this is room one, and this is room two. So, or it's reversed. I don't know. But for our example, he's in room one or room two. Um, he made a lot of good predictive movement snipes, which is, that's like, uh, that's probably one of the basic skills you need to have as a sniper, is to understand where people are going to move to give yourself the best chance to get off a free shot. Sniping, for the most part, is all about getting free shots off, and that's because you know people are going to be there. Um, and that's why people go back to the 50-50s, because you know someone's going to be in a 50-50, because it's the closest area from the spawns. In this particular case, you spawn here, you spawn here. So when you spawn in these two locations, the fastest way to go is right here. That's why it's a 50-50. These are the first spots you get on the map. And you see this in Trials a lot. A perfect example is Widow's Court. When you spawn a Widow's Court, what do you do? You go to church, or you go to A, and you snipe down into church. That's a 50-50. You know people are probably going to be there. And if they aren't, you have to reevaluate where you're sniping. You can't just stay there covering the lane if no one's ever going to show up. You're, you're going to live in your scope, and you're going to get punished for it by getting flanked. So yes, falling back when using the last word. That is, if you're going to use that weapon then that's something you absolutely have to get used to doing and you have to master it. And there's a lot of techniques you can do by falling back to get kills you probably shouldn't because of how other players will move into you. Again, yes, running away also is, is, a, is a great point because when, when you're outnumbered, you don't have to make a big play. If you don't die, then the, it's, a, it's, it's a neutral game state. Maybe you give up a little map control, which is okay. You can always work back towards that, cooperating with your teammates. But more importantly, you didn't give them any points. Yes, they got map control, but unless they can convert that into kill after kill after kill, it doesn't do anything. Uh, some things that he did 
improperly or poorly where he never really we never really saw him support his teammates with fire either with sniping or with his last word there were a few instances maybe a handful where he was shooting someone that was already primed or he was priming someone and then they got finished off by another teammate i can think of a couple that he did okay but for the most part the way he played was uh, as a solo flanker which is uh something we'll uh cover in a minute um and then he double peaked a lot and while there's nothing really wrong with double peaking it's dangerous and you have to know how to do it properly so that means sliding back into the lane that you were just sniping so that way you're not on the same head level that your opposing sniper expects or if you're already in the lane and they move out of the lane you can slightly readjust your angle you can stay heads up that's fine it's still riskier to stay heads up or you can crouch whatever you want to do but you have to make it as difficult as possible for your enemy opponent when they come back into the sniping lane to make the shot on you and give yourself the best opportunity to make the shot faster than they can. Yeah, that's the final one. The final one is the biggest thing is do not waste your grenades in the middle of a firefight and do not reload in the middle of a firefight unless you absolutely have to. If you run on a primary in the middle of your firefight and you have a sniper, it doesn't matter what primary it is. Don't reload your primary. You take out your sniper and you try to make a no scope. You try to quick scope them. You try to line up a shot because you're not going to have enough time to reload. Most of the time, you're not going to have enough time to reload, line up another shot and finish them off. You have to take risky shots if you're in that situation. Ideally, you should just kill them before you run out of ammo or keep better track of your ammo. Try not to start firefights with, uh, you know, an empty clip. Uh, yeah, no, no scopes for the win. No scopes are an interesting thing that I've personally been practicing a lot um, because being able to no scope someone consistently, not just like, oh, I accidentally lined up the shot well, but like knowing, okay, this is where my reticle is. This is where my reticle always is. This is how my gun looks when I'm hitting someone in the head, in the body, wherever. This is how it looks when I slide and no scope someone. Like th if you practice that, it becomes becomes very very difficult for you to be pushed as a sniper if you use your sniper as a shotgun and it also makes it so that it's very easy for you to push as a sniper you don't necessarily need to cover an orb if you know you can just walk up to the orb after it's rezzed and body shot them and melee them or get a headshot off or if you're so close to a self res that they're going to do it right in front of you you have the confidence to just take the body shot and finish them with a melee like and the way you practice that is just go into patrol, you know, whatever, whatever patrol you want to do, get, you can use a no land beyond or whatever. You can have double snipers, just run around in a circle and slide, get a no scope, try to walk up to, to characters, shoot them in the head, whatever you want to do, spend time doing that. And you'll slowly kind of get more comfortable doing it. And most importantly, like when those opportunities arise or when you can make those opportunities arise, just take the shot like nine times out of 10 until you get a good feel for it you're gonna fail and it's gonna look hilarious because not only you're gonna be down a shot but you're gonna look like you got egg on your face because you took this like ridiculous montage worthy shot and completely fell down and got bodied okay so i'm gonna give you guys some examples now using this map of what it means to support your teammates since that was a big thing that mythic kind of struggled with or didn't necessarily realize that he wasn't doing um and we're gonna cover that from the idea that we're a solo flanker so when we're a solo flanker we always have to keep track of where our teammates are and the reason we always keep track of where our teammates are is because that limits our options for what the best way to approach the enemy is so this is the enemy team this is our team, and this is us. Already we can see that we're out of position. We have basically no shot. If we're on generator, you can see on the perch, but this shot right here, it's really hard to make. It's, it's pretty tight to try to make that shot. So we kind of have, when, when, you're, when you're in a team uh, position like this and you're, and your teammates know that you're a flanker 
what you want to constantly be doing is moving around the map to get free shots on the enemy. And as if you're one of these two teammates, you also have to understand what it means to have a player that only flanks and that doesn't necessarily team fire with you. So as a flanker, in this particular position, we have two options. We can move up into B or we can move into cave. So let's start with moving into cave. That's our first option. If we move into cave, let's say the enemies haven't moved yet. In all these, in all these scenarios, we're going to assume the enemy doesn't move. Um, if we're in cave, we can move all the way into heavy, or we can move down underneath into B hall. So if we move into heavy, and this guy's on A stage, that's a perfect flank. Not only can we get free shots on this guy, but our teammates can probably get free shots when he turns around when you show up on radar. However, in this position, and based on where the enemies are, if this is a coordinated team, you're going to say, hey, someone's in a cave. And they're going to see, hey, someone's over here too. What's the lowest common denominator, the lowest risk that you're going to play that you're going to be able to make? It's just supporting. So these two guys are going to come onto A stage, and they're going to team fire the shit out of you. You're, you're not going to survive very long. So the first concept as a flanker that you have to master, and you're never going to be a good flanker unless you do this, is you need to know when you're no longer the flanker, but when you're the front. And as Scott said in chat, it's the, it's the, the concept of flanking and it comes from the art of war. It's been around forever. So when you're, when, when this happens, you're like, well, I flanked them, you know, how did they know I was there? Well, you know, everybody knows how radar works, but more importantly, you were no longer flanking when you started getting attacked because a, you didn't get a free shot off and B, everyone is shooting you. So the idea of flanking is you always get a free shot, one free shot. Why is that? Because if you hit them, they get a, you know, it, it flashes on their screen. Uh, you kind of know where someone's shooting you from for the most part. And that's why as a flanker, a sniper is a great tool to have because you can kill someone from long range. You don't give them a chance to really adjust to what you've just done. So let's say in this situation, they move to you. What do you do in this situation? What do you do as the flanker? Well, you're no longer a flanker. And because you're not a good pusher, by yourself you got to bug out you got to just turn around and leave so another concept that you need to know when you're a flanker is the idea that you know your escape routes and you know your exits and you should be able uh as a flanker to walk backwards throughout the entire map and never like and never hit a wall you should be able to obviously in a perfect situation that never happens um you know people get nervous or whatever but the best players they can know the map backwards without seeing where they're going so your options are you move back into cave, you go back underneath B hall, or you hop up here on the ridge, and keep going this way. So the more risky play here is to go up on the ridge because all three of these guys can continue to rotate around a perch or send one through into A and two into perch and you're going to get pinched and you're going to die in ridge. And if you trade it's going to be a bad trade because look at where your teammates are. Your teammates are over here. So they're going to not only kill you, but get an extra free 50 points for getting a res. And even if you trade, it's bad. It's still going to be bad because your teammates are out of position. And so when they try to push in to support you, they're going to get that res. And then it's going to be 3v2 and you're going to spawn, you know, God knows where, probably here or here. And you're going to be way too far away from the action and it's going to result in a very poor position for your team all right so back to our example so in a perfect world let's say you get the flank you move into cave you go to a heavy you kill him where do you go from here as a flanker if you get a free kill you leave you almost always leave uh, in this particular situation, you would always leave only because you're getting pinched from both sides. You're getting pinched in here and in here. But also why you leave is because you can bait someone in this particular uh, on this particular map into a, a choke point. And as a sniper, that's exactly where you want to bring people into is choke points because there's only a handful of locations 
where they're going to uh, be at for you to actually fire and hit them in the head or in the body or wherever. And that's normally either they're going to slide through, they're going to walk through at head level, which is ideal for you, or they're going to jump through. Uh, in any of those scenarios, generally, if you just aim for the center of mass in the body, uh, you'll get a hit. So after they come in here and you've bugged out, let's say you go the right direction, you go back here. So now, in this scenario, he's dead. And you're here in cave. If you've relayed this information to your teammates, your teammates should be pushing in. Your teammates should be going to pinch. And you can kind of get a feel when you play with uh, the same players when they're going to get there or how they're going to get there, how they're approached. Some people, they always approach head-on. Some people always approach from cover. Uh, some people mix it up. Um, or these guys, maybe these two guys always stick together, so they're going to approach the same angle. Either way, you should temporarily retreat and go back to being a flanker because they're getting pushed. This is the new front. You're gone. If they chase you, you can get a 1v1. That's that's Ideally, you should be able to get a 1v1. But if they don't, they don't. Just go back in. Go back in and pinch a guy. At this point, it's okay to trade. Why? Because you're always going to be a man up. And when this guy, the guy that you flanked finally uh, spawns, he's going to spawn as far away from the action as possible. He's not going to spawn in this area, ideally. He's not going to be here. He's going to be somewhere over here where he has to move all the way back around. So this map, so we'll, I'll cover a couple examples of uh, what it means to be a flanker on this particular map in Trials. And then I'll open up for you guys to answer questions. Okay. So in Trials, let's say we're a red team. As the solo flanker, you have to kind of decide and figure out how people are, are going to move on the map. And you normally figure that out by the second round, kind of where people are going to move to. Um, in Trials, you ideally want to be as unpredictable as possible. So it's a great opportunity for flankers because the flanker always wants to be unpredictable and you get to figure out the most annoying ways to move around the map to get to kill people for free. Um, so we'll just cover you. We'll do some t more teammate based strategies in the future, but for now we'll just kind of focus on what you can do as a flanker. So the one thing the flanker never wants to do, unless uh, you're very, very confident in your skills is go to the 50, 50. And if you do go to the 50, 50, uh, it's your fault if you die. You can't blame it on anyone but yourself because you tossed the coin and you lost. So in this case, you went to the 50-50. Okay, so that's your first option. This The 50-50 is always a good option if you scared them out of it. Let's say your teammates go to the 50-50 and round one and they completely annihilate who, them in room two. They like throw double firebolt grenades and everybody dies and that the round's over in like seven seconds. If I'm the green team... I'm not going to go to room two ever again. I'm not going to touch it. And what does that mean for you as a flanker? It's a free way to move around the map. You also know that this way is the shortest distance from spawn to spawn. So if if your teammates make them scared of going to the 50-50, you have to take advantage of that. Or be able to take advantage of that when it matters. So what are some lanes that you can do on Anomaly that aren't a 50-50? but are still flanks. So for the most part, if you're on green team, you're either going to go to the 50-50 in room two, or you're going to go through elbow, or you're going to code through perch. I should probably draw that in green. You're going to go here, you're going to go here, or you're going to post up here. Okay, so from this position, what does this mean? as far as where they're covering. That means they're going to cover this lane here. B to room one. They're going to cover this lane here. Boxes. Back to catwalk. Back to your spawn. And they're going to cover on perch, depending on which side they're on, across into B and onto the stage. So what does that mean for you? Where are, you, where are your options for moving? You can move through generators.
in the cave underneath all the way through and that lets you flank perch all the way through lets you flank elbow through here lets you flank room two so as a flanker on anomaly you have one great flank and that's always go through generators in a cave so again keeping in mind that if you are a flanker you have to be able to retreat your option to retreat is always through this cave back in the generator that's your safest option unless they've killed them in room one and are going to move into generator then you need to continue to push around and you have to be able to uh have a plan when things go south and that's that's why you watch all these trial streamers and they're in these last guardian standings and they clutch it out not because they're just so amazing that you know no one can touch them which you know sometimes it's true sometimes they're just that good or sometimes the opponents just don't have thumbs but other times most of the time and I would say for the best people that are running trials or doing sweats, they always have a plan. So this is going to be a concept that you're going to have to think, act, and react, or tar. This is a, I'm going to try to keep acronyms as short and sweet as possible. So as a flanker or as anyone really, you should think about where you're going and what to do when you get there. So, I'm the flanker this round. I think I'm gonna go through generator, I'm gonna go into cave, I'm gonna flank a stage. That's my plan. Think is always your plan. Think about your plan. What are you gonna do? Where are you gonna go? How are you gonna get there? So act. Gotta do it. It's okay to think about this. It's not okay to think about annoying playing with me when I'm constantly dying. Uh, so I apologize to people that have played with me and I've just not gotten any kills because I can't get anything going. So we've acted, we've gone through generator, we've gone through cave, we've gone to A stage and we've flanked some of the rotations. Um, as a flanker, you're always at risk. And if you die, you always screw over your team. Even if your team manages to win the 2v3, you're, it's just, you put them in such a stressful situation that sometimes you're a burden to play with. And I understand that as a person that always flanks, that it can be really annoying playing with me when I'm constantly dying. Uh, so I apologize to people that have played with me and I've just not gotten any kills because I can't get anything going. So we've acted, we've gone through generator, we've gone through cave, we've gone to A stage and we've flanked someone. So the react part happens when things don't go according to plan. When things don't go according to plan, you have to adjust. Oops. So what does it mean to adjust? Well, let's say we get to our flank and our enemy hero has moved to B. He's no longer there. We get there and by the time we get there, he's already in B. He's no longer on our flank. Well. You need to react to what to do next. If you move out on the stage, you are under no basically no cover. But if your teammates relay to you that, hey, he's on B, he's on table, you have a shot with a sniper. It's kind of a hard shot. It's up, it's it's up at an angle, and there's a lot of head glitches in this area here that it's really hard to see someone. Um, and if he just moves down the ramp, you basically have no shot. But if you're cooperating with your teammates, especially in trials, um, which you should be trying to call out when you see someone, not just when you're uh, dead, um, when you start fighting them or where you see someone because you don't know where, what kind of information uh, someone can use. Um, and it's always, it's always good to say where someone is. Even if you're clear across the map, if you know someone is in cave, I know that, well, if I keep moving this way, I'm gonna run into them. If I keep moving this way, I'm gonna run into someone in cave. Or I could retreat. If they're in cave and I'm last man standing, I could run away and find a better angle. So you need to react. So in this particular scenario, we can either snipe or we can push into him if we have a shotgun or we can go into rank and get another flank. But you have to adjust the plan when it goes wrong or when it changes. 
but initially, initially, you always have plan A. Plan A is always get here and kill the guy. So, uh, I'll do much more in depth trials as a critique if I get a trials game. Um, once we kind of get a vocabulary going as a group, then I'll start covering more complex things like spawn trapping and radar trapping and, uh, and being able to push spawns and kind of control the pace of the game. But for now, we'll kind of baby steps into, into covering the big, the big stuff for now. Fundamentally, uh, as a flanker, you're always at risk and you always want to try to minimize that risk. And you, and no matter what role you take, you always have to keep in mind this acronym. What are you going to do and where are you going to go? You need to do it, and then you need to adjust when you get there if it doesn't go according to plan. All right. Um, so I will open it up to some questions for you guys. I probably have ooh, probably 20 or 30 minutes. So if you want to type a question in the chat, I will do my best to answer it. It can be about anything Destiny related. Or if you want to know something about me personally, that's fine too. Um, but I'll leave it up to you guys. And if you guys don't have anything, then I will just wrap it up. Okay, as a flanker, what's the best way on Anomaly to survive or win a 1v3 situation during trials after teammates die? Um, as a flanker, it really depends on the location, but uh, you want to be able to pull people into choke points. So choke points being 50-50s are almost always choke points just because you know there's only one way to get to you or very few ways to get to you. Um, the problem on Anomaly with pulling people into choke points and why it's difficult to win 1v3s on Anomaly is because a lot of these choke points are close quarters, so it's pretty easy to get pushed with a shotgun. Um, but it also, it really depends on how the enemy teammates are moving. So if I'm 1v3 here, uh, I know I have a 50-50 shot here. If there, are no, if there are no snipers, and you should kind of, you don't necessarily need to know what they're running um, as far as perks or whatever go, but you do need to know, like, what guns they're running. If they, if they have no snipers, I know I can freely take this shot and not really be punished very hard for it. Obviously, if they get a bunch of Midas shots on me, I'm kind of screwed, but I know I'm not going to be counter sniped. So I can take, I can pull them into, into room two or opposite. I can pull them into room one and snipe across and get a free pick. But after you make that pick, you have to readjust because when you're in 1v3s um, and someone dies here, what does this mean for the enemy team? From the enemy team's perspective, they know where you are. They know you're in room two. What does that mean? They're going to be able to push into you and pinch you off. So you get a free kill, great. You don't need to cover the orb. if Because against good teams, they're going to push you from multiple angles and or they'll just use it as bait. They'll wait for you to cover the orb. They'll res him and then somebody's going to flank you and kill you immediately as you try to cover the orb. Like, good for you, you covered the orb, you got a free kill, but you didn't win the round. And the point of 1v3s is to win the round. So if you get this kill, you want to re readjust. Uh, and you want to kind of readjust so you can predict where they're going to come in to get the res. So if they're out on catwalk and they were going to come in here to get the res, stay here. That's fine. But if they're going to come through boxes and C stage to go back up into room one, you want to go to A stage, or you want to come all the way around to perch, about here, you can see on the stage, or you just keep moving in a closet, snipe down to the stage. This closet maneuver is only if they're really far away. Like That's like the enemy team is over here and over here, and they got to really book it to get that res. Most of the times it doesn't happen. Um, on the rare occasion that does, this closet is going to be an okay push. Um, but as far as clutching the round goes and repositioning, 
You should constantly be aware of where your teammates are and where those downed orbs are. That's the most important thing in 1v3s. You want to make it so it's no longer a 1v3. You want to make it so it's no longer a 1v anything. You want to make it a 2v whatever or a 3v whatever. You want to try to... If, if you get a free pick, if you can convert that into getting a res, you always get the res. Don't bother covering that orb. Let them get them up. You have a better chance of winning in a 2v3 than you do in a 1v3 or 1v2 because of team fire. Team fire is going to lower your time to kill on all your weapons. At that point, in a two in two v three and one v three or two v three situations, you can't be a flanker anymore. You have to be a team team fire player. You have to stick on their shoulders. You have to rotate around the map. You have to and you have to work to 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 support each other. Um, that's difficult for a lot of people that are flankers to kind of get down. Is once in those high risk situations, you don't necessarily have to come up big. Sometimes coming up big is getting another teammate up. Um, so as far as particular choke points you can pull people into, again, the 50-50. Um, if you're on boxes, you can pull people into this choke point here or over on catwalk or down an elbow. This is a, this is a difficult place to shoot into. It's easy to grenade, but it's difficult to shoot into. So if you know they just used a firebolt, you can probably safely take a shot here. If you think they have Firebolt up, I wouldn't go here. I would continue to either use it to bait a Firebolt or to uh, or to just stay there and and uh, try to get a free kill from, like, say, Catwalk. Catwalk is it's pretty hard to grenade from Catwalk into boxes without getting shot at first. Um, another good one is on Ridge. There's a really nasty head glitch right here on Ridge. I think, actually, it's, I, think it's, I think it's over here. It's about here. You can see down in the slide room. Um, there's like a rock over here that you can head glitch on. You want to make it as annoying as possible to kill you. Uh, okay. Previous example talked about going through cave. Could you pro con going into B instead? So going into B as the flanker instead of cave. The only time I'm going to B as the flanker, as, as I said, they're afraid to go into 50-50. You've destroyed your teammates or you have destroyed them in room two. Or if you're over here in room one, uh, and that means that this this lane here is opened up for free to move through. Now, the pros of going into B are it's the shortest distance from spawn to spawn. Is going in through B. Uh, that's that's probably the biggest reason why you go into B is because you need to move somewhere very very quickly. Uh, Another pro of, of covering B is the sight lines that you get. So this whole table here, I call it table. I don't know if anyone else calls it table. Uh, I've heard it ca called a couple times. Um, but you have a couple, you have a lot of sight lines you can cover based on where your teammates relay important information about enemy locations. So from B, you can snipe onto C stage from this side. You can snipe onto A stage from this side. You can snipe onto perch over here from right here. You can snipe onto this side of perch from right here. And moving onto B also means you can retreat into generators. And if you go onto back generator, you can see, let me get stuff out of the way. If you go onto back generators, you can see all the way over here or all the way over here, depending on which side you're on. And this. <laughs> This particular sightline is really nasty for supporting teammates that move into 50-50s uh, as a sniper. You can't, it's really, really difficult to actually cover the orb from this, from this position, but getting this pick and being able to reposition back onto B to cover the orb is what you want to do. And that makes it really difficult for, unless they know, they already know you've gone back here, um, it makes it really difficult to stop. Um, this is something that I do often to be super annoying if I know that the enemy team is going perch a lot. I'll go back to back generator and I'll just pick them off. And then I'll push into B. And I'll cover the orb from B while my teammates move around. Yeah, the best part about sniping from back generator is when you're standing up, uh, they can't hit your head from perch. 
you actually don't see the head. I believe you have to either both be crouching or the person on a perch has to be crouching. And if you're crouching on perch and you're not in the location where you can completely see the body on the edge, uh, you can't even snipe over it. All right, uh, any other questions? Hi, birds. <laughs> Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I will wrap this up for you guys. Uh, I really appreciate you guys coming out and watching. Um, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, so hopefully... Uh, oh, Birds, that's a question. Um, how do you play salvage on this one? Uh, I don't actually know where the salvage points are, or how they rotate. I know where they are. There's like a salvage point. I'll write the salvage points. Oh, a couple questions. Okay, I'll answer these questions and then I will wrap up. So how do I play salvage on this one? Uh, I know there's a salvage point here. There's a salvage point here under B. Um, there's a salvage point on A. There's a point on boxes. There's one in cave steps. Um, is there another one? I don't believe there are any other salvage point. Oh, no, there's one on back generators. Okay, so I know what I don't. I, I'm pretty sure that's all the salvage points, but I don't know how they rotate, like which one comes, which one's one, two, three, etc. Um, if you're actually playing salvage and actually trying to cap the points, uh, it's a lot of risk reward management. Uh, and when you capture the salvage point, you always, always, always want to capture it with all your teammates. You never want to capture a salvage point by yourself. Why is this? Because when you capture the point, you get 100 points per player. Okay, so you can get a maximum of 300 points. Three kills worth, just for capturing the point. And then I believe it's 200 per player. Um, if they captured the point. So you get an additional 600 points. Hey, that's fantastic. You get one, 900 points or nine kills worth if you capture the point. Um, the point lasts for about as long as it takes to kill people three times, two to three times. So if you're actually defending it properly, um, not only do you get 900 points for capturing it, but you probably got six to 900 points for defending it. Minimum. That means no headshots, you only killed them with a body shot, no one supported you, you didn't get any assists, you didn't kill with a melee, you didn't kill with a grenade, you just shot them with body shots. So it's a 1500 to 1800 point play. So what does that mean as far as risk reward? Uh, you only want to capture the point when you can, you have all three members up, and you know you can defend it easily, and easily depends on your loadout. Um, in particular, this point on B, very easy to control with a shotgun because everything is close quarters. It's really hard to snipe into here. Uh, as opposed to this particular salvage point in which everything has a great sight line to defend from. And you can snipe these pushes very easily. Um... And sometimes it's best if you don't capture the point at all. Like this particular point here, um, or this one here, I would let the enemy cap if they wanted to cap it and then try to push to, to stop it. Just because it's really, really hard to, uh, to control these. Um, cave is probably, this, this cave one is probably a little bit easier to control than generator just because like B, it's pretty close quarters. But the problem is it's so easy to grenade people that are trying to cover this. Um, and then the locations you go into to cover around the point. So in this case, you can cover cave or you can cover from generator. Um, 
there's just so many ways to come into generator to pick off that person are so many ways to come into cave that are risky to be here to try to cover this point without getting pushed very very hard um so personally if i was on playing uh playing salvage i would contest these points depending on loadout and i would let the enemy cap these or leave them alone completely uh to to disable them okay pushing special on this map which is a good topic to have so special on this map is really limited there's a special box here on catwalk there's a special box here under b hall which goes into cave and there's a special box here on ridge now depending on location you always want to get the safe uh special so if you're mostly on this side of the map you want to get the ridge special if you're mostly on this side of the map you want to get catwalk um, if you're in the middle of the map you want to get be all but how do you push the other ones um Ideally, if special's coming up and you know they're going to push the special, you want to contest the one where the fewest players are going to come. So this is always going to be the special uh, that's easiest to contest. Just because these are so close to spawn locations that they're almost always going to be unsafe. Um, you can all Because they're close to spawn locations, though, you can um, use them to bait people to get free kills. You won't stop them from getting special for the most part, um, but you can get free kills. And what do I mean by free kills? I mean like you go into slide room here or here and you snipe in. Uh, on catwalk, you go onto boxes here through elbow, here up on the actual boxes, then you snipe into catwalk. Or you come out here, see heavy, and you snipe into cat. B hall, uh, if you're a sniper, uh, the pretty much the only sight line is the underneath little corridor here that goes cave to b-hall um it isn't too bad to cover it's just kind of a weird angle to hit the head at because up here is an in over here on cave is an incline um so for the in initially uh always always take your free special um as far as how the game progresses if you're going to contest any any special when you after you've gotten your free one, uh, don't try to cross map contest. Always try to get the the easily contested one. I wouldn't particularly stay away from any special. Like they're all fine to pick up. You're never in any huge amounts of risk picking up these particular special boxes. Um, some of them are kind of out in the open, but they're pretty easy to cover when you're in that open. So in in ridge, um, it's pretty easy to cover into slide room from multiple angles. And when you're on catwalk, it's pretty easy to cover boxes and behind you as you pull it, or even in through B-Hall. Okay, so the future, moving forward. Um, the future streams will be Thursdays. And this will, I'll update all this information on the actual stream page, um, and I'll have it up on my Twitter, which I will give you at the end. Thursdays at um, 7 PDT, or PST, depending on when I do this in the year. And Saturdays at this time, 5 PDT. Um, for now, these are the only two days I'm going to do it because I don't want to kill myself doing this. And I also, more importantly, want to have enough time to review the gameplay that you guys sent me and not only review it, but pick ones that I feel like will be good for the week and then develop kind of what I want to cover when I do watch them because I want to provide you guys quality information. And even if it's a repeat, uh, if it's on a different map, I'm going to be able to give you different concepts of those same repeats. Uh, everything will be archived um i'll do my best to get everything edited and up on youtube 
so you can watch them in the future um, without most of the noise. <laughs> like you can always catch up and be a day late. Um, if ideally I want to add a third day, but only after I kind of get the swing of uh, how long it takes me to get these done. Um, the third day will be like a fun challenge day where on Saturday I tell you, hey, this weekend or, uh, you know, over the next couple of days, try to go do something weird and then send me clips of you doing the weird thing. Uh, in one case, let's say you can only use double shotguns on a map. So then I only get clips of people with universal remote and a shotgun or only get let's or double snipers or you can only use your secondary weapon or melee or grenade. So once you run out of secondary, you're running around trying to punch people, and then it'll be more of a fun, like, haha, look at this person. But until I get the normal critiques down, we won't do anything super fun. This is fun for me, but I don't I don't know if it's as exciting as watching someone only be able to kill people with supers. Uh, if you want to submit gameplay, you can do it to me at keenkoala at gmail.com. That's five E's and uh, you, you can do it there or at my Twitter you can submit a link at Keen Koala I would prefer you to send them email links just because I have I can keep them all in one place um, and I can put them all in a folder and kind of organize them as far as what I want. Uh, when you do send me gameplay, I do not want sixes. No sixes. Um, there's plenty to learn from sixes, but because of the chaos, it's really hard to develop how to do how to make plays uh, because they're so focused. Like the best way to win a six, six v six, is to play as a team, as a unit. Um, and I'm more interested in focusing on personal development and small team play. Uh, it's easier to come up with a play of three people than six. Um, but all threes and all rumbles are okay. Uh, threes being salvage, skirmish, elimination, or trials. And rumble is good too because uh, rumble is all about... Uh, is a different way to play the game and it has a lot of different concepts like kill efficiency and uh, map control as far as what you can do as an individual unit as opposed to in threes where sometimes you have to make team plays um, you have to rely on each other doubles is fine too double i know doubles isn't around for very long but when it is up doubles is fine um i would prefer not mayhem uh mayhem is a for fun mode and you should be having fun in it not learning how to play not necessarily learning how to play the game better uh if you want to learn anything in mayhem uh learn how to use your super better and learn how to shut down supers really good but I wouldn't use it for as a learning tool for anything other than just super practice or even grenade practice. Um, but as far as like conceptually, like moving around the map or understanding how spawns work, mayhem is just it's it's just another level of chaos that I'd rather stay away from. Uh, so thank you all for coming. I hope you guys appreciated this. Uh, it was really fun for me to uh to do this and to present this stuff to you um and i hope to see you guys uh next thursday at seven koala out